Uh, so hi, I'm Guido Appens. I'm Chief Product Officer at uh, Yubico. Does anybody here in the room have a YubiKey? Oh, wow, that's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for being a customer. That's amazing. Um, we've got a fantastic panel here today, um, all people that are, I think, some of the leading minds uh, when it comes to security uh, for any kind of cryptocurrency assets. And uh, let, me, let me start here uh, to my left. So Matt Parker uh, started two companies in the uh, crypto, cryptography or cryptocurrency space, uh, Voltage Security, bought by HP, and then uh, more recently, uh, 21, which was acquired by Coinbase. Matt, security, any concern for any of those companies? We thought about it from time to time. Uh, I, uh, I like to say I've been doing crypto since it meant cryptography. Uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's something I've been thinking a lot about for almost 20 years now. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things, certainly for us uh, at 21, was was the need to think about not only uh, uh, you know, information security, but physical security was actually a big thing, and I'm sure we'll talk a little about that as well. But uh, you know, something that is unique, I think, here to to the crypto world in some sense is the need to think about both of those. Perfect. So Matt, uh, Matt Miller is head of security for Coinbase. Um, you know, one of the largest exchanges and and pla general platforms for um, cryptocurrencies. Uh, in the world. Matt, what keeps you awake at night uh, in, in terms of security? I mean, the real question is what doesn't, right? Uh, <laughs> so just as context, I lead the Coinbase security operations team, which handles a couple things. Uh, one related to uh, detecting and preventing intrusions against our platform. Uh, the other piece being uh, the trust and safety of our customers. Coinbase really tries to be one of the easiest on-ramps from fiat into cryptocurrency, which means, uh, you know, we got kind of a user base that is, is brand new to the world of what does it mean to even have a private key, right? Um, and so when we talk about the concept of conveniently protecting those assets, a lot of what is convenient to these new consumers is not necessarily pr going to protect their assets, right? And a lot of what protects their assets, they're not going to see as convenient. And so this is a really, you know, kind of interesting topic for us that we dive, we dive deep on a lot. Um, Ultimately, you know, what I think keeps me up at night most of the time is, are we doing enough to help and educate the people that don't necessarily know enough about the space and yet want to get into it and can, uh, and, and, you know, uh, invest in cryptocurrency in a safe way? That makes a lot of sense. And I mean, from, from an exchange perspective, we've seen major attacks against major exchanges, you know, Mt. Gox back in the days to, I think, uh, um, probably Binance was one of the more recent ones, right? Um, it, it, and those have an impact on those companies, is that right? I mean, is, is that it's for you, it's a strategic concern how the external perception of your security is. Is that a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of perception just generally speaking when one exchange, you know, gets compromised, it impacts perceptions of all, you know, almost all other exchanges. So there's, there's definitely downstream ripples. Makes a lot of sense. Lance Vick, so Lance is the, I think, head security engineer, is that the, the right title? Close enough, um, by BitGo. So BitGo is one of the premier providers of custodian solutions, which I think, is, to me, seems like it's the hot topic at the moment in, in, in cryptocurrencies. And uh, Lance, w what's your general level of paranoia when it comes to, to crypto? Uh, is, uh, is, is high as I can figure out how to get it, and then, uh, and then I go learn new things, then have new things to worry about. Um, but uh, ultimately, yeah, um, I've been doing security research for, for about 20 years, and in that time, seeing so many different attacks, I've kind of gotten over this idea that uh, there's any one system that is impossible to defeat. Um, at, at Bico, we really largely focus on um, trying to spread out the risk into multiple locations and like multi-sig, and a lot of other uh, people in the space start to go that direction, and uh, that certainly does add a lot of comfort when you know that uh, uh, all these other things are going to have to happen in parallel in multiple locations. Um, but uh, uh, but there's always a worry. There's new attacks coming out every day. There's new zero days uh, coming for sale uh, every day that for, for down cheaper and cheaper prices. And uh, you start thinking, well, you know, maybe my phone uh, is reachable if somebody has the right amount of, you know, if there's enough value on it, it's worth it. Makes so Lance, you recently were a lot in the news uh, about uh, Japanese hotel robots. You want to say anything about that? <laughs> Uh, my general belief is um, uh, if there's motivation or anything to be gained by hacking a device, someone will try. And so uh, I try to beat them to it where I can. <laughs> um, uh, the hotel didn't necessarily see it that way. 
very happy about it. But um, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, these these devices. Uh, if you have any device in a room that has a camera or a microphone, you should generally just assume it's compromised unless you have reasonable evidence that it's not. And uh, be curious. Take things apart. You'll find the vulnerabilities. They are everywhere, and they're often not very hard to find at all. Perfect. So Lance had about 100 press articles or so written about him as he found a, a vulnerability in, a Japanese, in, the, in the robots of a Japanese hotel chain, which turned out to be easily routable and uh, <laughs> reprogrammable. And I think they pulled the robots since, but that was a, that was a great story. So let's, let's start with something very, very practical. I mean, many, possibly all of us here in, in this particular room have uh, cryptocurrency assets. Um, you know, th there's been a... I think one of the, the long-term questions has been, how do I actually, what's the best way to secure my assets, right? I mean, I do I print this on paper, put it in a fireproof safe in my, in my basement? Uh, do I have like some kind of offline uh, wallet um, that I'm using? Or should I rather go to one of the big online wallets or online exchanges and just keep my money there and essentially trust these uh, organizations? I mean, if we, if we go back in time, right, a long time ago, I would keep my money in a chest under my bed. Today, I usually have it at a local bank. And the question is, with, with cryptocurrencies, are we going to see the same trend, or, or is it going to be different? So let's start with Matt for a completely unbiased opinion of, uh, of where you think this is going. Of whether or not a Coinbase employee thinks you should keep your money with Coinbase. Hmm, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's a really, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of interesting trends, and you have to sort of step back and take a look at you know, what are you most concerned about? Um, you know, when you think about the level of effort that it takes to make sure that your crypto is not losable, that's actually just as much of a, a as the security of that, right? Um, and so, you know, you put your keys on paper, you put them in a fireproof safe, but that's only one fireproof safe, right? This is California, we have earthquakes. That bank could just fall into the middle of the, uh, of the earth. Um, and so now you need two safes, and now you have to have them geographically separated, and you know, all these different things. And so, you know, I don't think that there's one correct answer to this, um, you know, where you know, we try to make it as easy as possible to take care of kind of the disaster resiliency for you, um, still recognizing that you know, there's, there may be cases where you want to keep funds offline, um, but ultimately there's you know, uh, a lot of very valid reasons why the average person does not keep their money under a chest anymore. It makes sense. Matt, let's try to get some controversy here. Do you yeah, have yeah. Well, any you know, competing I think, opinion? Yeah, well, so I think, I think a, a big part of it is, is what are you doing with your cryptocurrency? So, uh, you know, certainly if you are actively trading in your cryptocurrency, it is going to be much more practical and convenient to the, to the topic at hand to keep it uh, on an exchange or, or, or online in some way with a third party that gives you quick access to it. Uh, but, you know, as you think about you know, resiliency and, and making sure if you're, for example, you're buying and, and holding your cryptocurrency, uh, you know, you might be worried, for example, is Coinbase going to be around in a decade? Uh, we all hope they will. Be. I, I hope so. We, yeah, we, yeah. we all certainly hope they will be. But, but the truth is that, that we don't know. And so, uh, you know, in that case, I think if, if you're saying, listen, I'm buying some Bitcoin and I'm going to sit on it for 30 years, then, then I think that, that taking control of that into your own hands and, and saying, I'm going to store that in an offline way, hopefully with, with some hardware uh, as part of it, I think is, is probably a good approach. Lance, what's your take? Yeah, um, I, again, I definitely am a big fan of you know, spreading things out. Um, but you know, as, uh, as mentioned, um, uh, if you want to trade, that's a very different use case than if you want to, to hold. And um, and rather than have one answer, you can have both. You can have um, your your hot that you're willing to move around more quickly and take a little bit more risk on, and you can have your cold that you say, I need this far away in a dungeon with alligators, right? Um, and uh, and I think it's okay to have that separation. I think that um, most major financial institutions historically have had that separation. Um, you know, where you, you you may put your gold far away and then you know hand out certificates for it. Well, you know, uh, there's some pros and cons to that over time. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, I, I definitely think everything needs to come back uh, to um, the best practices we know how to do, uh, even for, for both of these solutions. Um, uh, you can use hardware security modules for both hot and cold. You can use um, a lot of these tools and, and a lot of in, in these different situations in creative ways, and we have to think about that. And we also have to look forward to new technologies um, that might empower you know, trading in some different ways. Uh, Lightning and some other technologies are, are pretty exciting, and we should keep a close eye on these because they might empower some better middle ground. 
It, it, I mean, it's, I think it's also probably worth mentioning here that you know we we we've been talking obviously in the context of things like Bitcoin, uh, but you know if you think about digital assets more broadly and you start to think about distributed applications, that makes things a little more challenging because you're holding assets there that often are being used in the context of that application. So that that certainly brings a whole host of new challenges. So that that makes a lot of sense. I'd like to actually dig into some of the the topics that were mentioned here a little bit deeper, right? So, and, and maybe let's start with the. So it sounds like there's a role for both, is what I what I hear everybody say. We, we still we'll have both the chest with the gold under the bed and J.P. Morgan Chase around the corner, or or the the moral equivalent of that. What well, what if I'm a consumer? How should I pick an organization that I can trust? Or or maybe turning this around. Actually, let me ask a question. Who here in the room um, has a is part of a company or a service that, that handles uh, cryptocurrencies. Okay, so we have uh, about half or something like that. The, what are best practices if, if, if I run a company that, that handles uh, uh, cryptocurrency assets? What are best practices I, I should put in, in place? So, you know, what are the, what's the baseline? What's the advanced? What's the you know, uh, tinfoil level? You know, if, if, I, if I really want to, want to get fanatic about that, what, what, where do I start? Um, a couple things I would uh, say to that are um, you want to think through your entire uh, process from, from authoring the code to compiling the code to uh, getting it on systems, uh, anything that has logic that can pot potentially um, be exploited to you know, extract value. Um, you have to consider that any one of these points can be compromised, and that could be a single engineer that has been blackmailed. Um, it could be a single system that is compromised. And so things that you can do um, are, uh, for instance, you can have one engineer that writes code, cryptographically sign it with something like a, a ledger or treasure or a YubiKey. Um, then you can have whoever reviews that code uh, then go ahead and also sign that. And then you can show that, okay, there are actually multiple points I can prove that, you know, reasonably prove that looked at this code. And when you build the code, then you can say, okay, well, let's build this in multiple locations. Let's make sure that you know it is uh, exactly the same thing in multiple locations that multiple people are testing to it. And it's it's all this is all supply chain stuff, but um, that's where a lot of attacks have been happening. We've actually seen several attacks on crypto companies in these very vectors. Um, and I'm not seeing a lot of companies take steps in that direction. And I think we all have to try to level up together uh, and start to make these practices normal. Yeah, I and mean, I'd say, you know, for us, uh, we value consensus. Um, and what that means from a practical level is the more sensitive an operation is, the more people have to be involved, um, and they have to be involved in a cryptographically strong way, right? So humans combined with, you know, hardware security mechanisms. Um, you know, I think we, uh, you know, we, we constantly ask ourselves the question, you know, uh, how many hops to the funds? Right, um, you know, how many people will it take to get it compromised before the funds end up leaving Coinbase? Um, and the earlier you build in those sorts of consensus mechanisms into what you're doing, not just for writing code, but even for you know administering things, you know, through like if you have an admin panel, right, that allows you to make fund transfers on behalf of users, that should absolutely be protected behind, um, you know, behind some sort of consensus mechanism because attackers are always going to find the easiest way possible to move money that involves only a single individual. We also look at you know things like um, who's who's in your supply chain, um, you know looking at things like uh, node modules uh, getting compromised, you know to compromise a single you know cryptocurrency company, um, you know having a strong uh, understanding of like what your vendors 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 are. Um, these are things that if you know if you don't do that from very early on, it's kind of difficult to tack it on later. Um, and you know I think but those are just kind of two of the highest value things that we see for. Um, you know, mitigating classes of attacks. So can, I, can I stay there for a second? This is actually really interesting. So if, if let's assume I start a new company handling cryptocurrencies, could you attach like numbers to this? I need at least three people for $100,000 um, damage, uh, you know, type of attack and, and, and 10 people for, for 100 million or, or like, could you, give could you give anybody just general guidelines how to think about this in a more quantitative way? Um, I don't know that I would put specific numbers on it. I would just say the larger the amount, the more people you would want. Um, and you know that can be tricky if you're a three or four person startup. Um, do you want to have to call everyone into a conference room or get everyone onto a Google Hangout in order to move funds somewhere? Um, maybe not every single time, right? And so you have to sort of set those thresholds uh, based on who you think your adversaries are likely to be. I, th I think what's, what's kind of interesting and, and makes this particularly challenging is that 
you know, there's actually kind of four classes of attacks that you have to prevent against, right? So there's there's obviously application system security, which goes, you know, from from the moment you write the code all the way to obviously deploying and making sure systems are patched properly and so forth. Um, you've got to worry about user security, right? Or, or, you know, I, am I doing the right set of things to make sure that my users, who, who often don't actually understand how to secure their own uh, systems, are they doing the right things to, to protect that? You have to worry about insider attacks, right? And where, where an insider might be wittingly or unwittingly compromised, whether it's blackmail or simply because you know they picked up a, a, a USB key off the street and said, oh, I could use one of these and plug it in their, their systems, which that was how RSA was compromised. Uh, and then there's physical security, right? You know, making sure somebody can't walk in the data center and and get access to systems in, in a physical way. And and you know, obviously, all companies to varying degrees face these challenges. But you know, Matt and I were talking earlier. What, what I think is is makes makes it particularly challenging in 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 the crypto world is that attacks are so directly monetizable, right? Like in in, in other systems, if I compromise uh, some piece of data there are still a set of steps before I actually make money off that, whether I'm, you know, doing ransomware or I'm trying to then figure out how I, you know, how do I take two steps to log another person's bank account, what have you. You know, if you compromise somebody's keys, the money is yours. And, and that makes it very, very compelling for an attacker. I mean, I think, it, is it safe to say that together with, if, if you have a, you know, brand new zero day or you're sort of, you know, a really high-end hacker, you probably either target nation states for, you know, sort of geo geopolitical reasons or cryptocurrencies today. That's, that seem to be like the top two targets. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, uh, when you have, um, if, if you have an attacker that has $1,000 to spend and uh, the thing that is protecting the funds of their target is a, you know, reasonably well-designed smartphone app, then maybe that's okay. Um, if the attacker suddenly has a million dollars to spend, or a billion dollars to spend, they're, they're, they're a nation state, um, uh, in, well, in limited resources. Um, well, then there are, every couple of weeks, there's new zero days being sold for uh, iOS and Android and most major operating systems, and these are all on the table, and you have to expect that they are going to be purchased, and they're gonna be used if the return on that investment is high enough, because um, you know, morality isn't really a thing in, in some, of those, uh, those, some of those games. That makes a lot of sense. So, so let's pivot to the to the end consumers, right? I mean, so I uh, understand, you know, practices, auditing, you know, like consensus. Um, if I'm if I'm uh, running a software company or service that, that does this, what can I do just as an end consumer to prevent from being hacked, right? I mean, you know, we've. Uh, uh, recently uh, sat on a panel actually with, with Lance where um, uh, another person on the panel was Michael Turpin who had I believe $24 million of Bitcoin stolen uh, through a SIM swap attack and he's kind of suing AT&T for $240 million. We'll, uh, we'll w see how, how that ends. But I mean, th there's, at this point we're seeing large scale attacks against end consumers. Uh, actually, who, who in the room here has been SIM swapped? Well, it's almost less than I would have. Uh, it's uh, less than I would have expected. I mean, uh, we, 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 it's, it's. I think at this point, sim swapping is a pretty common attack technique. We're seeing, um, you know, exchanges and wallets react by by uh, removing SMS as a as a backup option. What would you recommend as practical things that I can do as an end consumer to to secure my Bitcoin? Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, sim swapping, I would say, is actually s uh, common enough that I know people who will likely never go public that have been hit by it because it can be very embarrassing. Um, but uh, but uh, hardware tokens, uh, of course, are, are a very useful tool because it's something you physically have. Um, and uh, more and more services are starting to support these. There are a number of major um, uh, players that are not yet. Um, email them, encourage them, tell them, hey, I need support for this or I can't feel comfortable using your services. Um, and, uh, and services that are offering SMS or you see your friends using these things, you know, help just stop trusting your phone for these sorts of things. Stop trusting your phone carrier with your money. Um, you should be able to believe in them, but they're not security companies. They're, they're, they're not equipped to protect large amounts of value because it's just a phone call away. Um, you also really want to think about little things in your own personal OPSEC. If your endpoint that logs into a service where you can click a button and, and move funds, if that laptop is compromised, then your funds can be gone, um, even if you are using a lot of other good practices. Um, so a big part of this is taking the time to educate yourself on common threats for endpoint security. Um, this could be a, something as simple as uh, you're on a, on a shared coffee table and there's a USB cable and you plug it in. Uh, I have a lot of compromised USB cables I work with uh, laying around my own office uh, that if you plug them in, they can compromise 
uh, any Windows or Linux or Mac laptop you plug it into uh, using keyboard input. Um, so then you have to start thinking about, okay, how do I charge my laptop safely? Do I carry my own cable? Do I carry a USB condom? Um, there's a long laundry list of things like this that we have to start to learn about to educate ourselves and when we're gonna start having direct access to move our own funds if they're you know, a large amount of value. Yeah, I think you know it's interesting because you know as someone who's who's tech savvy, hopefully, uh, I tend to look towards those sorts of mechanisms. Like this is how I protect myself, right? Um, but the reality is, you know, I'm still trying to get my folks onto password managers, um, and that's I think you know there's the kind of a fundamental lack of understanding around things like credential dumps and you know password spray attacks, and you know why wouldn't I reuse the same password? It's easy for me to remember. Um, same thing with two-factor authentication. You know, I think for a lot of folks, it's not what type of two-factor, it's why are you making me go through these extra hoops? Um, and, and so there's, a, there's definitely an education you know, battle that, uh, that is necessary, but at the same time, you know, for companies that hold funds on behalf of customers, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we're providing you know, mechanisms behind the scenes by which even if you choose to make bad decisions, there's something we can do to help you. Um, it's never going to be perfect. Obviously, you know, if a user decides to do something or you know, if they get themselves compromised or, or consistently you know, don't maintain strong security, you know, we can't, we can't uh, you know, hold their funds hostage, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of mileage we can get kind of on very simple things around, you know, use unique passwords through a password manager, uh, upgrade yourself to, you know, using some sort of hardware security key like a YubiKey wherever possible, um, and, you know, try to move away from using SMS 2FA and asking the companies that you work with to make sure that you can do those things. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, I, I would echo that. I think we have to, in some sense, take decisions out of the hands of, the, of users because users fundamentally will make bad decisions. Right? There's a famous study where the majority of people in this study would give up their password for chocolate, right? And 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 you know, sad but true. And and so, you know, I, I, in my experience, the best the best security technologies are the ones that that just don't give users options. In some sense, they they just say this is what you're going to do, and we have decided that it is best for you. And that's not to say. I'm sure people in this room have the sophistication often to, to make perhaps you know more informed decisions, but but for the average user, I, I, you know, we, we just we can't expect them to make those decisions. So this is actually interesting. So you busy, if I summarize it in terms of best practices, password manager, I think everybody agrees with that. Uh, hardware token, if you want the additional security uh, from that, and anything else. What, what do I about hygiene for my for my laptop, for my desktop, uh, you know, for mobile devices? Uh, I can tell you something I've started doing that um, I know will be a bit of a learning curve for some, but you know maybe worth learning for some for higher levels of value is uh, start to isolate your different workflows into different virtual machines. Um, I have a dedicated virtual machine for anything that is sensitive, where I'm uh, you know I'm going to be you know messing with funds or logging into any sort of administrative uh, access, and that's separate from the one where I do my random research, where maybe there's lots of random advertising and scripts and cross-site scripting and things like this. Starting to segregate your workflow, whether it's virtual machines or even physical machines. Um, these are simple practices to just think about like it's a biology experiment and, and keeping these different experiments away from each other so that you don't have cross-contamination. Uh, I think honestly a lot of classical things in biology actually start to apply here and you can use common sense if you start to think that way. Yeah, I think the you know the simplest thing um, and the one that we're, we're constantly trying to hammer home with users is you know just update things. Um, being on the latest version of a, of a piece of software is almost guaranteed to be safer than on the previous version. Um, you know, there's also I think you know glossing over the the privacy versus security debate. Uh, using a Chromebook um, versus using sort of any other operating system is just a little bit more hardened against against attackers. Um, and you know, for for uh, you know most people, what you're doing is mostly online. It's mostly through the browser. Um, and so these are kind of like you know, low effort ways to, to increase your security without, you know, kind of, uh, you know, having to, you know, engage in, you know, uh, isolation or, um, you know, setting up things that, like, again, I'm thinking about, like, what am I going to tell my parents to do? I'm going to buy them a Chromebook. I'm going to set up their accounts for them. And they will have something, you know, kind of to your point, like, don't let the users do something insecure. Uh, they'll, you know, they'll be part of my G Suite organization, right, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I would actually even go a step further and say probably for your average user, using your phone, particularly an iPhone, is probably the best platform uh, in terms of reducing the, the overall threat risk. Uh, as someone who's done a lot of mobile phone research, um, and, uh, and I, I, bu I build operating systems for, security hardened operating systems for phones, um, 
I also really aware of the limits of these things. I would not trust Android or iOS device today, um, given a lot of the vulnerabilities that are out in the wild um, when it comes to trusting it with the ability to move your funds. Again, it does depend on the amount of value you're talking about. Um, but uh, uh, so if we're talking about $1,000, sure. <laughs> but uh, if you're talking about a few hundred thousand dollars, maybe not so much. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. And, and it certainly, I think, you know, any of these, whether we're talking a Chromebook or, or a phone, uh, you know, in conjunction with, with uh, a dedicated piece of hardware is, is obviously going to give you better assurance. Uh, one thing I would like to, uh, to point out here that was, was interesting, taking stuff out of the user's hands, um, is, um, you know, classical banks, if I try to move a large amount of money all of a sudden in an unusual country, uh, the bank says, hey, um, this is unusual, we should talk about it, right? Um, and, uh, and that's where I, I also think as users, we need to start demanding our custodians or those people who have any, any control over our funds to start issuing uh, policies um, and say, hey, if you are gonna move uh, this amount of money, maybe just you can log in and just do it. Um, if you wanna move this amount of money, uh, then hey, maybe we need to have a video call or maybe we need to actually do two-factor authentication or two-factor authentication for multiple people. Um, and th these are just policy systems. That's something that you know, BitGo really prides itself in and we'd love to see other vendors adopt. I think those are, those are very good points. And coming back to the mobile device for a second, you probably know this better than I do, but I believe that the cost of zero days on for mobile device actually has gone down, right? Specifically in the iOS space um, over, over the last couple of months. You mean the total number, or no, no, the the, the cost. Oh, the, the cost. price of a, of a zero day. So if I want to buy a zero day for iOS, it's cheaper now than it used to be. Right? Yeah. In fact, uh, there was a pretty interesting article recently. Um, uh, it's on my Twitter feed somewhere. It was about uh, uh, some of these um, people that run some of these zero-day dark markets are starting to say that they're they're beginning to turn away uh, iOS exploits because they're getting so many of them recently. Um, and uh, they're now we're like 1.5 million. Now they're often going for a million. Uh, that's not good. <laughs> So, so let me add my a little bit of personal paranoia. So you know, you, you mentioned like have different virtual machines for different tasks. I mean, one thing I do at home is that I either use computers for gaming or for work, but never for both, right? Just because you know, once you have a couple of mods plus Steam on there, <laughs> this is essentially a compromised machine that you know too many people have have access to. And I, I'm a networking geek, so I recently I also segmented my home network into VLANs. I'm not sure how many people do that, but uh, you know, with an with an intrusion prevention system at the at the front, it's kind of interesting. I mean, at this point. With, with IoT, right, I probably at this point have half a dozen devices, uh, you know, that call home to various places in Asia where I'm honestly not sure what company runs the backend service, right? And it's like, well, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, to think about the, the implications there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of them are completely reputable, um, and, and I'm sure some of them are probably not, right? But uh, it's, it's sometimes, you know, if you buy a $9.99 uh, a smart uh, um, a power plug that phones home somewhere, um, you have very little visibility and security practices of these vendors. Hmm. Yeah, one thing there is uh, um, if you have other devices in your network that you don't trust, and that's probably true of virtually all of us, whether that's a, a console or any number of devices, um, you may not want that device to have knowledge that you're using you know, BitGo or Coinbase or whatever else. You may not want them to have knowledge of what sorts of services that you're using uh, in order to make yourself more of an attractive target. And this is where things like uh, Tor and VPNs can come into play to also, from the endpoints that we really need to care about to have that isolated. So, um any questions from the audience here? Anything? We have some some really uh, um, great experts here on, on security. Anything you would like to know? And let's start here uh, with a, a gentleman in the middle. Any recommendations for physical security? Look, I. As as uh, as I work for Ubico, I obviously have a, a pretty biased perspective here. What you should do, but uh, let me open this up to the to the panel. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think one of the the more uh, you know easy things to do is like you don't want to brag on social media, right? Like that already makes you less of a target uh, physically. Um, you know, I think in terms of you know how you think about uh, you know protecting yourself, um, you know whether it's where you store your you know uh, your hardware wallet, which might be one of the questions. Um, you know, I think it's it's one of those things where you know you have to look at. Uh, you know how how do you feel about your home, right? And like, you know, how do you feel about the safety of things in your home? Um, there's a whole bunch of other you know aspects to physical security where it's almost like I, I sort of think about it as like you know where would I put my passport, 
right? Um, where would I store that to keep that safe? Um, and then depending on the amount that you've got on that, you know, on that Trezor or on that ledger, yeah, okay, I'd probably keep keep that in roughly a similar spot. Um, but in general, at least from you know more of an exchange perspective, we see uh, a correlation between people being prominently known for holding large amounts of cryptocurrency and there being more of a physical security threat. Um, otherwise, by and large, uh, that's not sort of an attack class yet that we're seeing become super prominent. So it's sort of like, I would think about it in the same way as like, are you worried about your laptop being stolen when it's at home, right? Or are you worried about your laptop being stolen when it's here in this in this crowd? Um, at least that's that's kind of what we've we've seen. And we do sort of monitor for, you know, the day when attackers switch from focusing on attacking you digitally to, you know, like rubber hose cryptography, where they just beat your password out of you. <laughs> you know what I was going to say. You know what I can say is, as uh, having run a company where, as a company, we were storing a lot of Bitcoin. Um, we ultimately only trusted paper, uh, and and you know how you get how you get your your keys onto paper is is a longer topic and interesting question because you don't just want to plug a machine in and plug a printer in and do it uh, but at the end of the day to the extent that you are you know you are planning to hold, sit and hold a lot of of cryptocurrency or crypto assets for an extended period of time uh, you know paper is tried and true and you got to think about what kind of paper you're using and make sure that it won't fade over time and you want to make sure that it can't burn and so forth but uh, it has some significant advantages relative even to something like a treasure or ledger I would also add that, um, I, you know, rubber hose cryptography, we are starting to see this. Um, there's at least five documented cases now of people um, actually going and essentially mugging people over a single digit million uh, a dollar value of, of crypto. And so if you're holding a holding large amount of any kind of value, not just crypto, you probably don't want to have solitary access to it that you can do quickly. Um, and this is a common sense thing. However, it is unfortunately a common sense thing that not a lot of people adopt because they say, oh, it's cryptocurrency, it's secure. If you can log into a computer and you can move the funds yourself easily and quickly, uh, then somebody can make you do that. Um, and so for your own safety, you'd be very wise to make sure that's not true. That makes sense. And you know, just to, to add uh, a little bit from the, from the uh, Ubico perspective, uh, Google actually released a really interesting study where they looked at um, attempted account compromises for uh, 350,000 accounts. So it's a good sample size. And, uh, you know, if, and then they cataloged different ways of protecting these accounts and how effective they were. And they had everything from SMS, which, as you can guess, was only moderately effective, right, um, to uh, things like device push, which is a little bit better. But uh, basically, like a simple security key, like a $20 security key, um, they ended up with zero single, with, with zero compromised accounts out of the 350,000. So I think it's one of the, the cheapest and most effective ways. So, uh, cert yeah, certainly if you're using, if, if you are storing your crypto with a custodian, like a Coinbase, uh, I think it's, it is certainly a no-brainer to be using a hardware authentication token uh, when you log into one of those services. And frankly, you probably shouldn't use a service that doesn't support one of those. Uh, that's a no-brainer. All right, perfect. I think we're up on time, and we're standing between a, a, a you and lunch. So uh, let me uh, thank the panel here. This was awesome. Thanks for, for making it out here today. And thanks, to everyone, for coming.